I just finished presenting this today with my friend Clark Rotifer, and I thought that I would share it with everyone. So we showed this at the McCall Conference in Michigan, and it's a good overview of why we made these game design project packs, and it'll help you see the big picture of how the process goes. So as always, I did this because um, I want to help teachers to stay inspired with good ideas, good creative ideas, so they can share that with students. In this case, you might not care at all about games. You might not want to work through this process yourself, but I'm planting some seeds here that you could suggest to a student who wants to present their learning in a unique way. Practically speaking, these are um, accessible, engaging game design projects that can result in deeper learning. And I'll talk about how that could happen. So first of all, why game design? One of my mentors, when I was finishing up my master's course, studied under Dr. Fred Goodman at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Goodman said, you might learn something if you play a game, but you will certainly learn something if you make a game. And I can attest to that. I learned so many things as a game designer, from tech skills to communication skills to um, applying many of the math skills that I had acquired as a math teacher. There's a lot of learning involved in making a game. So um, if you want to look at standards, here are some of the common core that we picked. You can see a link at the bottom of this on my main game design project pack site where we are continually updating it with different reasons or different standards and things that we're trying to cover in school that relate to game design. Here are some others, 21st century skills and some ISTE tech standards. Now the thing with these packs, what you want to think about is that every game has a theme. I'll give you an example, or I should say most games have a theme. And what you're going to do is take those things that you're teaching in your reading, your ELA class, or your history class, and through the theme of the game, you are going to tie that into your content area. And that's where the deep learning happens. To give you an example of what I mean, take a game that does not have a theme, like Uno. Here's something that you're probably familiar with. Uno itself is not about anything. When you're playing Uno, nobody is pretending that they're running a business or they're discovering um, ancient ruins. You're not doing anything other than playing cards. It doesn't have a theme. So to think about how our game packs relate to the content, imagine that you were going to turn Uno into a game about Romeo and Juliet. So you would say to the class, okay, look at this, this draw four card. Think about how that makes you feel when you play it on someone. Think about how you feel when it's played on you. What's something in Romeo and Juliet that we could we could tie that to? Who's a character that is cruel that we could put their name on this card? So it's no longer a draw four card. It's going to be that character. That's where you're applying a theme to a game. Now, Uno would not be a good game for this, and I'll show you why in a couple slides. When I used to, when I was learning games, I realized that. Um, a lot of times what they do on these games is they have an effect. Like when you play the card, this effect happens, and that's based on the rules. But something that really captured my imagination was what we call flavor text. And flavor text is not about the rules. It's about what the game was based on, in this case, a Lord of the Rings quote for this Gandalf card. And what really... Uh, intrigued me was that many times that flavor text would capture the essence of the material, in this case the Lord of the Rings books, and that game effect. So that flavor text didn't have any effect on the game directly, but it drew the player into the theme. And if you can get to that point with these project packs, you're really touching on the heart of the learning that we're trying to achieve. Now, the downside with most game design projects in school is that they take too long. Another problem with them, I found, teachers would base them on these games like this, Monopoly or Risk, that take hours to play. Students had fun making these. Like, they'd say, okay, you know the game Monopoly. Now make one about immigration. And so they would do this, but nobody would play the game. Or maybe it'd be a trivia game that wasn't very fun. I wanted to make some game design projects that didn't take too long, 
people would actually want to play them. So here are some ways that I solved this. First of all, I went with non-digital, so you don't have to learn to code. I went with simple rules, very few components. I made a flexible structure so teachers could fit this in their schedule, depending on how many days they want to devote to it. And I based it on newer design trends. If you're wondering where the tech is, I based everything on Google Docs, Google Drive, all the, all the files are like Google Slides or Google Drawings, and you can share it through Classroom. So here are how they look when I make them. I purposely leave them sparse so students can use their imagination to make them look like they want. There's planning sheets shared as documents. Here is how one student did her artwork to remake one of the games. So the students get to add their art and make the cards look a little better. Some students even do color artwork. If you're not familiar with these games, I will say they are getting more popular. There are many games coming out that the average person doesn't know about, but games like Catan and Ticket to Ride, which you see here, I'm finding more students actually have heard of those things. Clark and I have been at a group that meets in Rochester, Michigan, and they, they have probably 60 people a month coming out to play these games, and I often see games there that I've never heard of. I try to capture some of those design trends in these games. So if students are saying, what are we doing playing board games? Assure them that board games right now are enjoying quite a renaissance, quite a golden age, and uh, many people are having fun with them. It's a great time to be a game designer. You notice on these boxes, one trend is that the um, designer's name shows up on the box. So it's a good time to be a game designer. And if you're familiar with Kickstarter, look at these projects. Um, this is not the norm, but some of these games, this one made almost $9 million. That made quite a splash in the gaming community. It's a card game. And this one broke the record currently with um, over $12 million taken in for that game. So it's a good time to make board games. I'm not saying every kid's going to get rich. I don't want to draw them in with that lie but certainly people are still playing board games. So then at that point in the talk, I take them into my blog and I show them the game design project packs, talk a little bit about the flexible implementation, which you can see on my blog, and show them some examples. Here's a game that I actually published using the Game Crafter. And you notice here there is a page on my site that is for students. So you can just direct students to that and they can learn a lot about game design. At that point we jumped into the project and what we did was they chose a base game from the four, watched the video, learned the rules, and we didn't have as much time as I hoped to do this, but the idea was they would make their version of the game like the students do. They go through the planning sheet and that's what causes them to dig deep into the learning. So in our session, we were going to do this, make the cards, and then they would test it. And then there's a reflection stage, just like the students would do.